as you go into your world. We love you, Teddy, but God loves his children. May you find your identity in being a son of the only perfect father. May you make it possible, make it impossible for your daughters to ever find a husband as good as their dad. May you teach your children that their mother is the most beautiful woman alive. She's really pretty. May you risk more, worry less, and play hard. May you lead your family, not as a king, but as a servant. Who protects their hearts, protects their hearts. May you laugh at the little things, the little things. And finally, and finally, may you lay down your life for your family. And may you introduce them to a God, to a God that's already done that exact thing. We hope that you have a great day today. Great day today. Have a great day today. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Well, today uh, is Father's Day, and we're going to uh, talk about that a little bit. I've asked... It's just kind of like we did on Mother's Day. I've asked some people to come and join me, join up here and to uh, share some thoughts. And so I'm going to ask that uh, Malache and, and uh, uh, Stan will come and, and join us up here. And Malache, you're, you go first. Oh, I am first. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. I have a lot to say. <laughs> But no. Don't encourage him, okay? <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. Um, thank you for asking me to do this. Uh, it is an honor to stand in front of you and not singing and uh, to speak. Can you hear me? You have to speak louder. Okay. All right. I will speak louder. Um, I, am a, I am a dad. Um, Yay! Yes, yes. <laughs> By the grace of God, um, I have four kids. Um, I have one in uh, Sebastian. He's in a children's church. He is eight. He's, he's a mix of myself and my wife, when you look at him. He's more like my wife in uh, resemblance, but he's more like me in attitude. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, and it's nothing but the grace of God. I promise I will do this without crying. Help me. <laughs> um, and ever since I was younger, um, having kids has always been a struggle for me. Um, I've always been scared of the thought of having kids, of being a father. Not having kids per se, but being a father. And. Uh, and the enemy kind of plays with that. And you know, fear is not just a feeling. It's not just something that you feel because, oh, I'm scared, something happened. Fear is something very spiritual. Because what it does, it keeps you away from the things that God has, has in store for you. That's pretty much all it does. And I grew up with this fear. And as if the enemy knew, you know, and even in my adulthood, one day, I can remember I was working. And I was working with this lady who doesn't know anything about me, really. And I can't remember what the conversation was about, really. And the enemy used this lady. And yes, the enemy does use people around you. The enemy used this lady to tell me this. You will never be a father. So I'm begging God for a day for me to meet this lady. 
<laughs> so I can say, hey, remember you said this to me? I, I just can't wait uh, for that. So when she told me this, it kind of sealed the feeling in my heart that this is the way that this was going to be. Um, and life went on. But, you know, God is a, is a God of promises. That's right. And there's a verse in the Bible that says that God, his promises are without repentance. The things that he said about you and myself, they are not going to go away. Of course, the enemy will fight for them not to happen. But surely they will happen. Because he is not going to repent of the things that he has said about us. And, you know, the Bible says that love chases fear away. That's my, that's how I can put it, the simplest way for you. And back in 2009, on the Red Letter Weekend, God told me this. You will be her husband, and you will be her father. And when, when, when I got this promise, it kind of let God sped up things. That was in March. I got married in December <laughs> of that same year. So that's one, that's one kick for the devil. And um, I got married back home in Haiti to my wife, Edna, and you all know that that's, that's, a, that's a different story. That's not the day for that. And then my wife came to the States, and so are we going to have kids? Are we not going to have kids? So, um, you know, we just got back together, so we kind of want to enjoy our lives before we have kids, so, which is okay. And then on December, um, let me get my D correctly. It was December 31st of um, 2011. I always pray at the end of the year that God give me a word for the next year. And I kid you not, I got up and I sat on my bed. I opened the Bible. And I opened it exactly on Genesis 21, verse 1. And it says, the Lord came to Sarah, just as the Lord had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what the Lord had promised. That was in, on December 31st. I said, okay. I stayed quiet on it. In March, we found out we were pregnant with Sebastian. And everything went well during the pregnancy. My only worry with this, the whole nine months, did he stay in for nine months? No, he came in two weeks early. <laughs> he, well, he, but he was eight pounds, so it was time. My only way with the whole time was, what was it going to look like? <laughs> but God surprised me. He came out with a head full of hair, peeing all over the place. <laughs> as the doctor was taking him out. And, as, and when you think about the things that the devil wants to do, and the beauty of what God does... There's nothing that you can compare. And after we had um, Sebastian, you know, we can, I wanted to have, you know, other kids. And uh, let me, um, <laughs> I promise I will not. <laughs> and then um, in 2016, we found out that we were pregnant again. And everything was going well. And on the, 20, on the appointment that you have on, tw on the 21st week, where they do the anatomy and all that, when we got to the doctor, there wasn't a heartbeat. So we, we are there in this room. And, and the thing is, you're going through all these questions in your head. You, know, you want to know what happened. You don't know what caused this. And all the doctors can say is, this happens. And they don't know why. It's like the kids start growing, and then they stop. How long has, had it been from the last appointment to this one? We don't know. But there wasn't a heartbeat. So needless to say, we, we went from that appointment to a different appointment. 
where they had um, to take the baby out. And that was just unimaginable for me. I, this is not the thing that was planned for that day. And this man was right by my side the whole time. I owe him a shirt. Well, maybe two, three shirts. Because <laughs> I cried and started on him so bad. And that happened. And we waited a little while. And we got pregnant again. And this time, at 22, my wife's water broke. So we rushed to the, uh, to the hospital and everything. And um, they, there's nothing they can do to save the baby. It's too soon. The baby would not leave to, uh, you know, to the labor and all that. And we believed the first one was a boy. So we called him Daniel. Uh, well, the second one, really, the second child. And then this time, it was a girl. She looks exactly like me. <laughs> and that was Grace. And as hard as that was, watching your wife push out a dead baby is not fun. So soon after that, we found out that we were pregnant again. And this time, at 22 weeks, her water broke again, and we had to rush to the hospital. Um, same scenario. We were having a boy, and his name is Luke. And to make this story short, as painful as this was, as many questions that I had, it felt like a defeat every time. It's like you went into battle and somebody just knocked you down and you just, and you stay down. That's what it felt like. And through all the prayers, you know, and sometimes God doesn't answer. God doesn't really say anything sometimes when we pray. And that's okay too. And that's okay, but is it still God? Yes. He's, he still is. That's, then I realized, well, the power to give life or the, or the power to make people die, that's, just not, that's not in my hands. That's not in my hands. There's nothing I can do. I can ask questions. I can beat myself up. As a father, I can try to explain things, but I can't do that. Um, what God has used to heal my heart was watching my wife heal. Because I couldn't, there's nothing I can do about this. As a man, as a provider, you know, you go out there, you do things, you get things done, but this, there's nothing I could do about it. So I watched God heal my wife, and that was my healing. And the other part was Sebastian. I have his, what, he was at six, seven at that time. He wants questions. He knew his mother was pregnant, and we went to the hospital, and we came back with no baby. How do you address this? Of course, you know, we talked about, you know, the baby was sick, the baby died, and the babies went in heaven, right? But to me, it just didn't feel like that was enough of an explanation to give to a young, to a young child. But time went on, and Lately, every night when we pray, he is what he says. God, be with my brothers and sisters that are in heaven. Every single time we pray. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this is the thing I'm trying to do myself. But God ste stepped in front of me and healed this boy for me so that I don't have to go through my life, or trying to explain to him how this happened. The truth that is so hard for a lot of people to get, God has sealed it inside of a child's heart. And it's, it's very, I mean, it's, it's crazy to believe it. But he is okay. And that's been, that has been the second part of my healing. All the, 
And now I can stand in front of somebody. When you ask me how many kids do I have, I will tell you, I have four kids. One is here with me, but the other three are angels in God's presence. I have not lost kids. People think of it that way, but I have not lost any of them. Of course, sometimes I go to the paperwork that I had to fill out at the hospital and look at it. Um, they were cremated, so I, sometimes I look at the little box where they have the little ashes in. And I'm like, well, this is not what you gave me. This is what men gave me, but this is not what God gave me. What I have is three kids that are in heaven and one that are here. And I know a lot of people struggle through this. It's okay to cry. I'm still crying. So what? <laughs> But God is faithful to, it, to, to all that. Healing does happen. God does come and he touches you. And I couldn't be part of a better church going through this. Denise has been a mother to me. And Pastor Jack has been more than a pastor for me. And you have surrounded me with, with love and you have surrounded my family with your love at every, every single time that it happened. Would I wish that it happened again? No, I don't want to go through that again. It's not, it's not fun, I don't want it again. So we have kind of stepped back from, you know, from having kids. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> I turned 40 last December. I want to see Sebastian grow up. I don't, want to, I don't want that to be, you know, the thing that I preoccupy myself with. But if God makes it happen, I am so open to it. Let it happen. And I'm so glad that, you know, here's what has been done in our lives. And I'm happy today because, guess what? Hey, I'm a dad. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Well, one of the things that I enjoy most about Father's Day is just remembering how great a father, earthly father, that I have. Um, my dad has been a wonderful father to me, um, a great provider. Um, we weren't wealthy, but we never lacked for anything. And um, my father always made sure that we were in church. Every, every time the doors were open, we were in church. And he lived before me a, a godly lifestyle, and I saw my heavenly father through my earthly father. And um, Daddy told me when I was growing up, he said, well, you know, uh, do well in school. If you want to go to college, I'll take care of that. And, and he did. He paid for four years of college and four years of middle school. But, um, but one thing that that I really didn't appreciate at the time so much, I guess, but as I grew older and then had my own children, my dad was the one dad in the neighborhood that took time to be with me and my friends. I mean, he took us swimming, fishing, playing ball with us. I mean, <laughs> every afternoon when it was time for my nanny to come home from work, everybody came to my house because, you know, we all wanted nanny to spend time with us, and he did. He made time for me. And I didn't realize just how much or how important that was until I grew up and, well, got married and had children. We, and two children. Our first child was a son, Patrick, and he was born in my last year in middle school. And so we came back, and it was a real busy time getting the practice started and all that. But we noticed there was something a little different with Patrick. He wasn't developing normally, and so anyway, after two or three years of a lot, a lot of um, doctor visits and found out that Patrick had Soto syndrome, 
which is characterized by mild to moderate mental retardation and delayed neuromuscular development. So we knew that he was going to be challenged mentally and physically, but we determined at his very early age that we were going to give him the best life we could. So um, now Patrick, he had very minimal speech ability, and I mean, he could feed himself and walk, but there was a lot of things he couldn't do. And he had to have somebody with him at all times. And he, he was high maintenance. Um, he, he, he required a lot of your time, but my father had, had always spent time with me, so, I mean, that's just what I thought you're supposed to do, you know, you spend time with your children. So there was a lot of things that Patrick couldn't do, but the things that he could do, and he enjoyed doing them, that's what we did. Now, he, he loved to shoot basketball. He couldn't run and play basketball, but he would shoot basketball for hours. Well, we would do that every day. And he was good. He actually went to the Special Olympics in Atlanta and won a gold medal in shooting basketball. I mean, he was good. Um, and another thing, he, he loved the mold. So every Friday and Saturday, I took him bowling. Every Friday and Saturday. Um, if we were out of town, we found somewhere to go bowling. That's just what we did. And you know, I, I can't tell you how many times complete strangers would come up to me and say, you know, we appreciate the way you knew with your son. I mean, you could tell that, you know, he wasn't right, but we just appreciate you spending time with your son and taking time with your son. And Well, like I say, I just, that's just what you did. I mean, that's what my dad did with me. You know, he spent time with me. And um, so that, that was just what we did. And then, um, in 2007, we found out that Patrick had cancer and well, he had surgery and the surgery was successful in removing the cancer, but a week after the surgery, he developed some problems. Well, he ended up being in Memorial Hospital in intensive care 111 days. Now, that, that, that was tough. But, and I, you know, I, I had to work. But those 111 days, I did not miss one day being with Patrick. I mean, he was, he was my life. And God gave me the strength and ability. And there again, so many people would say, you know, we, we really appreciate you know, you coming and being with him. But, you know, that's just what you do with your children. You spend time with them. Yes. And our second child uh, was a daughter, Katie. And it was uh, challenging at times to, because spending so much time with Patrick, to spend time with her, but, you know, I made it happen. You know, I including her in my life. But all this was because my earthly father had been that kind of father to me. And he showed me how to be a father. And he also showed me what kind of heavenly father I have. Um, because he being an earthly father knew how to good gifts good good, good gift to me. But he showed me what kind of a heavenly father I have. Now, Patrick passed away in September of 2007, but, you know, we, we know he's 
has been healed and in the presence of God, and we look forward to seeing him again. My earthly father is 95, and, um, and really all through my life, he's continued to be a part of my life, always wanting to know what, what can I do to help. And one thing about my dad, he never wanted me to borrow money from a bank and pay interest. Borrow it from me and pay me back. That's what he said. Borrow it from me and pay me back. Don't pay interest. So that's what I did. And um, there's so many things I can tell you how he continued to be a part of my life. And then three years ago, we started noticing some changes and found out he had dementia. Well, it continued to progress and um, in February, he, we put him in a VA veterans nursing home. Well, and then two weeks ago, I, I saw my dad there and that's the first time that he didn't know who I was. And that's, that's very hard to, to see the man that's been such an influence and such a help to me all my life, seeing him like he is now. But I still rejoice in knowing that he's been a good, good father to me. And God has a purpose and a plan. And he knows what's best, but I just thank God that, that I had the father that I have, and I, I'm always trying to be the father that I saw my father be to me. So, and I, all through the years, and doing what I did in church, I always made a point on Father's Day to say, hey, if your father's still alive, and you can't be with us today, give him a call and tell him you love him and happy Father's Day. This will be the first Father's Day. I've not done that. But um, I just thank God that he's helped me um, to be a good, good father to my, my children. And thank you and God bless you. There was uh, a third going to speak today, but he is a surgeon, and he let me know yesterday afternoon that he had an emergency, and he's actually performing surgery while we're here at church. So uh, Joey Bowen was going to speak, and so I am the uh, poor substitute. Um, uh, and uh, I will kind of wrap up our remarks today. Thank you, Stan and Malachi, for sharing your life. You know, I, uh, as a pastor, you, you get to do a lot of joyous things. I got to officiate uh, Emily and Dustin's wedding and be there. Huh? Ellison. I can't believe I keep saying that. S. Ellison. And I got to officiate Tiffany and Rick's wedding, and that was a fun thing, too. Uh, but uh, there are also things you do that are not nearly as fun. And uh, I've been in hospital rooms that weren't fun. I've watched fathers' hearts crushed. And, but I am so glad that I serve a father who shows up in those moments. I was there with Patrick. And I watched him show up. And I was there with those three. And I watched him show up. You say, is there hope in that? Absolutely. You know, we may go through difficult things, but our God will be there and He will show up. 
and he will be faithful. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I can't say, talk about that. <laughs> uh, I've been thinking a lot about the father figures in my life, and I realized something. Most of them are gone. I'm at that place in life. <clears throat> they live on. They live <clears throat> on only in the honor I give them as I talk about them to my children and my children's children. <laughs> they weren't perfect. <laughs> Let me repeat that. They weren't perfect. Frank Pittman said, Fathering is, is not something perfect men do, but something that perfects men. <laughs> and I really believe that's true. In today's world, we focus so much on what people do wrong and want to cancel them, and we forget the things they do right. And uh, there are three men who have been fathers to me <clears throat> who are now in the presence of the one who saved them. The one who redeemed them. <clears throat> and they deserve honor. They deserve honor. Jim Volano, Volano, the famed basketball coach known as Jimmy V, he said this, My father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give another person. He believed in me. He believed in me. These three men gave me that gift. The first one is Harris Fennell. Right in there with him is Freddie Goss. Uh, but Fred, Harris Fennell was a spiritual father and a pastor in my life. He was there the day I got saved. It's him. He's the one that preached. It's his fault. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember a whole lot about what he said. I just remember the altar call. I remember asking, thinking, can he hush so I can go down to the altar? <laughs> but he affirmed the call of God in my life. He taught me about ministry and about pastoring. He, one of the things he said to me is, Jack, you can motivate people with one of two things. You can use fear and intimidation or you can use love and challenge. He said, fear and intimidation will wear off, but love and challenge will last for a lifetime. Be a pastor who loves and challenges. <laughs> and that was a good thing for me. He, he gave me a lot of things. He gave me my first opportunity to preach. Denise was there. We weren't married yet. Um, it's amazing that we are married. Because I was there, I preached my message. I preached it three times, and it was only lasted five minutes. <laughs> It was a powerful five minutes. Uh, and Harris was so gracious, and he rescued me. And he helped me out. That's one of the reasons why I always look for young preachers that I can give them that experience, because somebody has to get you started. And that's what a father does. They get you started. They get you started. I thank God for him and for Freddie who gave me my first real job as a pastor who was a mentor in a life in my life. They believed in me. The second is my father-in-law. Herschel Deeren. It seems a little raw because he passed away so, so recently, but... Uh, <clears throat> and I, he, he would not like for us to, to get sad. He would like for us to rejoice. He also would like to terrorize us. He, uh, I was courting Denise. I had come to visit him. Matter of fact, it was the first time I came to visit them. And I was staying at their home. And uh, so they had given me a room. And I went to, to go to bed that night. And he snuck out of the house, came around, went to the window and started scratching on the window. <laughs> yeah, he did that. <laughs> but there are some things he did. He prayed for me every day for 42 years. Every day. <clears throat> he let me marry his daughter. <laughs> that was a faith venture. <laughs> He encouraged me. He challenged me. He spoke life to me. 
He was a huge Alabama fan. That was his kind of his life. That was what he he kind of lived for Alabama football. And but one of the things he would do is if Georgia ever had a really good game, he'd call me and say, "Man, they were playing good." I thought, "Man, that hurts you to say that, doesn't it?" <laughs> but he was a man who believed in me. In the last days of his life, every time I saw him, he thanked me for loving his daughter and raising good kids. And then he would ask me to pray because he knew his time was short and he was making a journey home. He believed in me enough to want me to pray for him. And the last one is a man named J.D. Moon. If you've seen me, you've seen my father. That is the absolute truth. I am taller, but if you look, he, uh, there is no denying where I came from. <laughs> we are the same. We have the same hairline and features. Uh, I, I look just like my dad. Uh, it's a little scary. I do things like my dad. That's really scary. <clears throat> In my office is a football helmet from my high school playing days. He bought it for me just to let me know how proud he was of me. Just when I brought Denise home and I told dad that she was the one, he said, man, we need to get that girl a ring. <laughs> we need to seal this deal. <laughs> uh, I, I did not... You know, some of y'all don't understand this, but uh, I didn't have a lot of money and I didn't have the ability. And Denise and I didn't really think that would be a possibility, but yeah, it was. We were, we were excited about being together. But, uh, and it led to one of those great moments because I just snuck it on her finger one night. <laughs> and she was like, ah! <laughs> But my dad made that happen my last semester of college. And, my dad had always taught me, I, I appreciate what Stan, how I many you know you are the product of your father's influence? And uh, my dad taught me a lot of things. There's some things I wish he hadn't taught me, and you know, that's, that's just the truth, you know. <clears throat> but my dad told me, he said, son, uh, I'll take care of you, but once you get married, that's your family, and you take care of your family. He said, "That's now it's into you. And he, he wanted me to take marriage seriously. He wanted me to, to, to know what it was going to cost. And so I, I took that very seriously. So when I married Denise, I, and I was still in school, and I was finishing up school, and, and so I never, I never asked my dad to, to pay for anything. I, I just, that wasn't the way it worked. You just didn't do that. And so, uh, and, and because my dad was successful, I never qualified for financial aid. Uh, I was like, I'm married. I'm paying my own bills. But they made me, it was weird. I couldn't. And so I never, and that was a blessing because I graduated without any debt. Uh, I worked hard. I worked three jobs. And, uh, but uh, the last semester, uh, I owed $1,500. And I didn't have it. If you all ever know what that's like. I'm right there. I'm at the edge. I'm, I'm going to get there. And I didn't have it. And, uh, and so I, one day I went to the uh, administrative office to say, listen, I, I, don't, I can't pay my bill. and I don't know what I'm going to have to do, but that's not going to work. And uh, they said, it's okay. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. Your dad called. He, he said, what, what's the O? And he paid my bill. He never told me. He never said a word to me. He just did it. And, uh, you know, I did it because he believed in me. I, uh, I call my dad. <clears throat> I wish I missed calling my dad. But I call him and he, he always asks this question. He say, Jack, what are you preaching on? <laughs> what are you going to be preaching on Sunday? And I can't, every time, I mean, it could have been terrible, but every time he would say, that sounds great, send me a tape. They had come to a point where we no longer were doing tapes, but he, <laughs> he said, Jack, that sounds great, send me a tape. And uh, 
because he believed in me. He believed in the call on my life. He believed in me as a man. And uh, I miss all three of these men. I miss them. <clears throat> I wish I could call my dad again. Uh, I always would ask him for advice. He was an attorney. Please love him. He was a godly Christian attorney. I know those sound like oxymorons, but that <laughs> he was an ama amazing godly man. And he had faults. I, please, he had faults. He, but uh, he was a great resource. <clears throat> I miss all three of those men. All four. <clears throat> There's a Yiddish saying that Shakespeare quoted. It says this. When a father gives his son, gives a gift to his son, they both laugh. <clears throat> but when a son gives a <clears throat> gift to his father, they both cry. And I didn't really understand that, but as I thought about it, I kind of grasped it. As a father, I'm, I'm privileged to be a father of four. And there's nothing that makes me more joyous than to give to my kids. I, I love it. I enjoy it. Uh, no matter what it is, whether it's material or time or whatever I can give, it, it just and it makes joy. I you know I I know this. My boys and they're they're amazing young men. They, they have turned out to be good, godly men, and I am grateful for that. But I know this. My boys don't just call to chat. They. <laughs> They're just not that way. They don't, that's just not the way they are. So if my boys call, it's because they want something. <laughs> and so I know that that's not a bad thing. I actually, I embrace that. I want that to happen. I'm looking for it to happen. Because that means they still need me. <laughs> Which is important. And uh, so they'll call and say, Dad, can you help me do this? Or, Dad, how do you do this? Or... And that means everything to me. It means everything to me. And I love to give. And we get together, and when I do that, when I'm giving, it, it, it brings laughter. It's joyous. But I understand this. When, you give, when a son gives back to his father, what it says to the father is, I did it right. <laughs> what it says to the son is, I'm grateful. <laughs> That's why... We laugh when the Father gives, but we cry, not from sorrow, but because it's a good thing when the Son gives. <clears throat> and I thought about that as we conclude our service today. I'm grateful for my Father figures. I've had some amazing ones. I'm grateful how they've influenced me and have led me closer to Jesus. I'm grateful for how they've impacted imparted to me the encouragement and the giftings that have helped me to become a, a minister that I am today. But I'm most grateful that they introduced me to my Heavenly Father. My father, my biological father, he was the first one to introduce me to my Heavenly Father. My pastor father and was the one that... <laughs> created the trauma that got me there. <laughs> and my, my father-in-law was the one that maintained and helped me see that clearly. And so here's the thing. The most important thing they ever did for me was to make sure I knew Jesus. And whether you've had a good father or you haven't had a good father, whatever it is, there is this capacity to have a father in your life who is an amazing father. An amazing father. And that father will show himself through others, but that father can be in your life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the whole point of Father's Day is to make us aware that we have a Father in Heaven who loves us and who has done everything possible for us to have a relationship with Him. I'm grateful for all the great gifts 
the fathers in my life have given me. But the most important gift I ever got came from my heavenly father. Where it's, he gave his son Jesus Christ to suffer and die. To take my place. And to pay my debt so that I could be restored back to relationship. And whereby I could, through that restored relationship, cry out, Abba, Father, to an eternal heavenly God who loves me and who has done everything possible to make me know him. I'm grateful for that. So today I want to wish all the fathers happy Father's Day. If you, as Stan has said, if you have the capacity and you can, be sure and tell your father happy Father's Day. Call him, talk to him, do something. I, I, you don't know how much I would give to tell my dad happy Father's Day. I would love to do that. Or to call Denise's dad. I would love to do that. If you have the capacity, do that. You say, my father was a stinker. Still calling. Because the Bible says this, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that you may live long in the land. The way we break a chain is to do something different. <laughs> it's as simple as that. If you want something to be different, do something different. And here's the thing, if you'll do that, God will do something amazing. God will do something amazing. Uh, I have been, uh, there's a, I forget who said it, but the most important title I've ever had is the title called Dad. It is by far one of the things that has been the, brought the greatest joy. A lot of pain, but the greatest joy to me. And I'm grateful for it. If you're here this morning and you need a father, a good father, I'd love to introduce you to the one. His He's made it possible through His Son, Jesus Christ, for you to know a true Father. And I would love for you to know Him, for He is a good, good Father. Amen. Denise. Lord, I just thank you this morning for these fathers and for their story. I thank you, Lord, that Stan and Malachi will one day see their children again. I thank you, Lord, that, that uh, even in a world where there are fathers who do not do the thing that they should, you, O oh God, will step into our life and change the story, change the narrative. So, Father, I pray that today if there's anybody here who's in desperate need of a father, a true father, I pray that this is the day that they have an encounter with you. That they may know you through your son, Jesus Christ. That they may encounter you and experience what it means to have the love of a father in their life. Lord, I pray that you would, just in your grace and in your mercy and in your love, heal that place in that person's life, Lord, where that void that's left... From not having a father's heart watch over them. Lord, I pray that today you are here to speak into their life. That they would receive that, that love, that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness that you will provide and offer. So that they could experience your grace, your love, your fatherhood in their life. Lord, it's, it's as simple as, as a simple prayer. Lord, save me, change me, love me, forgive me. And Lord, you'll step into their life and be a good father to them. Lord, I thank you for it. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Denise is going to begin to lead us in worship. And if you're here this morning and you need a father, maybe you've had a great earthly father or maybe you've not had a father figure at all, but you just desperately need a father. You can have the eternal father who will love you, who will never forsake you, who will never abandon you, who will watch over you, who will provide for you, who will walk with you. And you can know Him. You can experience Him. You can know His love this morning. And all He's waiting for you to do is to say, Lord, here I am. Step into my life. I give my life to you. Become my father right now. And he will do it. He will do it. So if you'll stand with me right now, Denise is going to lead us. And if you'll open your heart, he will step into your life today. It says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You say, well, what, what is it about? Well, the Holy Spirit is the conduit by which everything God gives and does comes into our life. When the Holy Spirit's there, you get it all. When He steps into your life, everything that He is steps into your life. And here this morning, if you you need something from your father here's the deal he says if you'll ask I'll send the power and I'll bring it I'll bring it and if you're here this morning and it's just before we leave and I know we've got activities and things and there's display back there and all the things we got a little gift and all that's cool but it's better that we get something from our father so if you're here this morning and, and you need your father to do something for you, I'm just going to invite you maybe to make your way up to this altar and say, Father, I need, I need you today. And I need you to do in my life today what I cannot do. I may have a, a, a father who's done his best, but I need my father to send his spirit to bring the best of heaven to me. And if that's you this morning, while we sing this again, you'll just come. I believe this. There is a Father in heaven who will give good gifts. Who will give good gifts. So as we sing this, if you'll just open your heart, if you'll respond, if you need to come forth, we'll pray with you, but we're believing that the Father in heaven will do something amazing for you today. I am. down here. Jer Jeremiah is facing open heart surgery in just a few weeks. But I serve a God who's bigger than surgery. Amen. And uh, I serve a God who steps into our messes and does amazing things. And uh, I got a glimpse of what God feels about us. My little girl, who is now a mother of four, was sick. tiny and she was sick and, and I was, couldn't, couldn't get it better and it wasn't going to change and I remember holding her and saying God I'll take what she has just heal her just heal her now she's a mother of four God stepped into it but what it showed me is that that's how I feel and I'm broken how much should God feel I don't know what you may be facing. I don't know what's in your life. But I'm here to tell you, you have a Father in Heaven who will take care of business. He will get the job done. He is that kind of Father. He loves you. He loves your children. I don't understand all the process. I just trust Him. I just trust Him. And He will step into those things and do a miracle. So, I want you to pray for Jeremiah and for this mom and dad and, and for every parent who's looking at something that looks impossible. 
but God is a God who does the impossible. Lord, we thank you that in every situation, in every place, you're a father who can do what we cannot do. You will step into places that look impossible, and yet you will show yourself strong in those places, Lord. You will do things that man cannot do. So, Lord, we lift up our children. We lift up the needs that we have. We thank you, Lord, that you are able and you are strong and you will move on our behalf. So, Lord, for every need that's represented here, no matter what the world has declared about it, we speak, my God is able and he will. So, Lord, we pray miracles for Jeremiah and for every situation. We pray the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to flow into those lives and do what will leave us in awe and wonder. We thank you for it. Now today, Father, I bless our fathers. I speak blessing on them. The job that they've been given is is an amazing and hard and almost impossible job but they can do it through you. And I bless them today. Whether they're a a new father or a great-grandfather, I speak your blessing on them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.